So NATO membership should never have been increased after the Russians abolished the Warsaw Pact. But certainly, if you really believe in NATO, you don't start taking in countries that are going to be ticking time bombs of insecurity. And this was the first sentence I wrote that brought the wrath of these people down on me. There is no the Ukraine <clears throat> in the sense of a civilization or a country. There was a post-Soviet Ukrainian state, and it was a mess. And even Ukrainians themselves agreed. It was corrupt. It was divided. But historically, and this is not Putin's fault. If you want to blame somebody, blame God, if you're of such a frame of mind, or history, to be more agnostic about it. History created on the territories upon which sat the post-Soviet Ukrainian state, a very divided country, politically, religiously, ethnically, linguistically, culturally. A large part of the country, primarily in central Ukraine and western Ukraine, wanted to become part of Europe. And a large part of the country, primarily in eastern and southern Ukraine, did not want to give up its ancient century-old attachment to Russian civilization, the Russian church, or to its Russian in-laws. Though, of course, if you want to get rid of your in-laws, it would be a good idea to join <laughs> Europe because they're not going to get visas and you'll say, sorry, can't have you for Christmas this year. But this was a profound... Gorbachev has made the point that his wife, Raisa, his beloved wife, <clears throat> was Ukrainian, and all his in-laws were Ukrainian. And my wife, Katrina, and I have met more Russians than not who have Ukrainian family, extended family. So <clears throat> you begin with the fact that this was a divided country. And if there was ever a country that needed some kind of federation to stay together, to keep people happy, to mediate differences, decentralization, it was Ukraine. We have a federation. Canada has a federation. Germany has a federation. Lots of countries have federations, are federated governments. But in Ukraine, <clears throat> when the crisis began, president of Ukraine appointed the governors of all the regions, and sometimes even the mayors. Kiev decided, and this was an underlying issue, even the most prosperous parts of Ukraine economically, which was eastern Ukraine, because it was the industrial heartland of Ukraine with the real trade, which was with Russia, paid way too much taxes and got too little back from, from Kiev. So there was this underlying tax issue. We fought a civil war, which was about slavery, but these other issues were embedded in the slave issue. But we fought a civil war. There was no need for Ukraine to fight a civil war over this. So I don't tilt toward Ukraine. I'm aware that there's Ukrainian civil war, and civil wars are the most horrible of wars. And in the modern day, they lead to a proxy war. Yeah. Putin could not let, after February, Donbass, which is the region <clears throat> in eastern Ukraine that's both most industrial and most Russian, but not only ethnically Russian, because there are a lot of ethnic Ukrainians for whom, <clears throat> excuse me, Russian is their native language. They can't even speak Ukrainian. You guys know Klitschko, the former heavyweight boxer, guy six foot eight. His brother is now the heavyweight champion of the world. I get him confused, Vitaly and Vladimir. Well, one <clears throat> went back to Ukraine, retired, gave his championship to his brother. Went back to Ukraine, became mayor of Moscow. He quickly turned out that his first language was Russian. His second language was German, because he'd been fighting out of Germany for 15 years. His third language was very poor English, and he could barely speak Ukrainian. But Maidan was about ethno-nationalism. So you couldn't really, and Poroshenko, the president's Ukrainian, but it wasn't very good. What's the point here? More Russians, at least when this all began, the more Ukrainians, no matter where they lived, spoke Russian as their everyday language, fluently, grammatically, culturally, well, and watched more Russian TV and all the rest than they did Ukrainian. Now, the Ukrainian government's trying to stop that by unwise methods, forcibly. But you can't say you're for or against Ukraine. And that's, of course, the bunk that the State Department's been putting out. You've got to say this is a civil war. Now, you could say, Gloria, if you wanted to do something Americans shouldn't, which side we favor. But we shouldn't do that. 
And if people ask me, well, which side is worse, Kiev or the guys running the rebel operation in Donbass, I revert, when asked which is worse, to the Russian intelligentsia proverb, both are worst. <laughs> both are worst. So Minsk, and Merkel put a lot of political capital on this. Alain at that time had no political capital. He was trying to get some political capital. On these Minsk Accords to resolve the civil war, because if the civil war stopped, the killing would stop. And then, as Churchill liked to say, jaw, 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 don't fight, fight, fight. But this required certain constitutional agreements that could only be passed by the Ukrainian parliament, the Rada in Kiev, which it has refused to pass. And mainly they involve something we all understand, more home rule for Eastern Ukraine. But, and this is what's interesting, <clears throat> a constitutional amendment that devolves what we, we used to call it states' rights, and we're hearing about it from the Republicans now, budgetary, political, and the rest, to Eastern Ukraine is not specific. It devolves these same rights to Western Ukraine. And whether you like it or not, and whether this is the right word or not, there is a surging neo-fascist movement in Ukraine. They took 30% of the vote in Kiev last week. Klitschko won re-election, but he was forced into a runoff. 30% of the vote, because the candidate ran not on one of the neo-fascist parties, but on some surrogate party. He got 30% is a lot. When people tell me neo-fascist are marginal forces in Ukraine, that's 30% too much for this Jew. Way too much. I can live with 1% if I know where they are. <laughs> and they running strong in these traditional ultra-nationalist Western provinces of Ukraine. So if the Minsk Accords are fully implemented, and if the decentralized constitution is democratic, you're not going to get virtue everywhere. But at least it puts it to the, the Ukrainian people, to all of them. And one of the conditions, of course, is that there be a complete ceasefire and all foreign troops leave the country. And you say, oh, that's great, the Russians will have to go home. Well, so will the Americans. We are told officially we have 1,200 American soldiers, boots on the ground, in Ukraine, training Ukrainians of, under Kiev's control to fight. If you think it's 1,200, I will give you the George Washington Bridge for a dime. I mean, that's what we're told. But they're running a lot of special op uh, operations there. But if this happens, we have to go home too. And the Russians have to go home. But the trouble with sending the Russians home is that really in some fundamental way, leaving military aside, they live there. Like their in-laws or not, they live there. And there's never been a time when there wasn't free passage back and forth from Russia to Ukraine. It's just a stake driven through the heart of a vast family. And now Crimea is, 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 remains an irritant. But for the Europeans, the sanctions are no longer about Crimea. And I assure you Obama doesn't remember why he put sanctions on Putin. I guarantee you. The first time, he, he doesn't remember. But it's all about now the fighting in eastern Ukraine. But Crimea could be solved too, to everybody's reasonable satisfaction. But they won't talk. They don't talk. Will Paris change that? That's a, you, that the pro-Kiev lobbies in America are not merciful in this regard. They just do not care what happened in Paris. They came out immediately by saying, Putin is the worst terrorist. He's the worst terrorist. Oh, I don't, de no, no. If you're asking me of whether there's been a big, vested, mainstream, economic, political, cultural, ideological commitment in Ukraine for 20 years, that's very much the case. And whether that played a role after 13, that's the case. And there's nothing bad about that. It's just a factor. 
I mean, the reality is, is George Soros has been deeply involved in Ukraine in ways that have not been made public, though he writes an article about it, 5,000 words, it seems, or somebody writes it for him in the New York Review of Books every other month. I mean, his commitment there has been longstanding and deep on one side. He's not been an ecumenical figure. He's bitter about Russia because the same operation in Russia failed, and he left Russia in anger and fury. So there are a lot of people, uh, people who sincerely believe in democracy promotion, that we can bring rule of law to other countries, and I think that's all virtuous, and there's nothing wrong with it. And I had a lot of students when I taught at Princeton who work, went to work for these organizations and to the CIA. My position was that it would be great if my smartest students went to work for the CIA. They didn't go to work as spies. They sat in little cubby holes, but unlike me, they got classified information. And now what their estimates, as they call them, how far up they got, we never knew, but we want the smartest people, the most open-minded people in all these agencies. But it's also true, Gloria, <clears throat> um, that a very representative spokespeople like Carl, what's his name, Gershman, and Charles Crothheimer, people who speak for vested interest, have said literally the following since 1993, 1994, and then repeatedly thereafter. The fall of the Berlin Wall was only the beginning of the American march. The brass ring is Ukraine. I mean, there has been at least one group, and I don't know because I never go to Washington to speak of, whether it was a big and an influential group or a marginal group, that from the beginning, as soon as NATO expansion began, which was when did Clinton decide, 96, 97, that Ukraine was the brass ring. And you know, this big Brzezinski's famous statement that made no, makes no geopolitical sense whatsoever, but it was clever, that without Ukraine, Russia is a normal state, with Ukraine it's an empire. This became the kind of ideological justification that then we would have a tamed Russian bear who would do our biddings, but as long as they're allied with or control Ukraine, Russia will be an empire that, uh, that, that threatens us. So they had a perspective. It was serious. I don't deride the intellectual thought that went into it. It was just profoundly wrong-headed. It was dangerous to American national security because it either didn't understand or didn't care about the way the world was trained, changing. And I don't want to say they're, they're responsible for Paris, but how many more Bostons in Paris and 9-11s? And by the way, just so you don't forget this, to be humane, Russia has still lost more souls to terrorism since the 1990s than any country on Earth. They tend to lose them in batches of two and three, four hundreds, in airplanes, pitch battles, that school in Beslan, that theater, what was it called, the Nort in Moscow. We, did, we lost 3,000 plus on 9-11. Paris lost, I think they're saying, 150 or so. Some in the hospital will die, unfortunately. So, But Russia, if you're counting victims of terrorism, <clears throat> gets to be number one. It's not the sporting event that it was competing in. But you got to be aware of the fact <clears throat> that in addition to being part of the solution, Russia has suffered probably more than anybody else from the problem. And that was what was lost, I think, <clears throat> in Washington in the 1990s, this sense of this is the real brass ring. From our audience, why is a Europhile Ukraine on an economic trajectory similar to the Baltic states to be opposed by Russia? Can this question be answered without reference to NATO expansion? In other words, is Re Russia has an independent difficulty with Ukraine's economic um, westernization. Uh, but I don't. So, so what, 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 why is Russia threatened? Why does it feel by threatened a about Europhile Ukraine? Right. On e economically part of Ukraine, anyway, mm -hmm. on an economic trajectory similar to the Baltic states. So, so in other words, what the Baltic states already have, and Russia's learned to live with, why right. did it create exactly. a fuss over Ukraine? Exactly. That's something like that. Well, not many Russians are married to Balts to begin with. 
Uh, secondly, the Baltic states clearly were, came into the Soviet Union. They were the last to be brought in, and they were brought in by brute force. Most of the other parts of the Soviet Union were parts of either the Tsarist Empire or came in through civil war as the fallout of World War I. But the Balts were clearly different. And American policy never recognized, I think this is right, Gloria, officially, we never re recognized Latvia, yes, Lithuania. The captive, captive Latvia. nations. But in law, we never recognized them as being uh, part of the Soviet Union. And that's why, if I remember my history, Stalin told Churchill, I'm at the Roosevelt, at the UN, if you're not going to count the Balts, we want three seats, right? And so Ukraine and I think Belarus or somebody got, they, but the Balts were clearly exceptional. Secondly, when people tell me Putin is going to take the Baltic countries, I say, Zachem, Pachem, what does he want the Baltic countries for? He's already subsidizing their energy 100%. Now he wants to pay their pensions too? For a sliver of indefensible land? I mean, what? So partially, it just makes no sense. But economically, the question's absolutely right. The, and this is for economists to work out. The Russians took the position that the, you all know what the Eastern Partnership was, right? The NATO Eastern Partnership? All right, you're not sure. In 2008, the Bush administration tried to fast track Georgia and Ukraine into NATO. And it was vetoed by Germany and France. So, a guy in Poland who became foreign minister named Sikorsky dreamt up with Karl Bildt, the former foreign minister of a Scandinavian country the so-called Eastern Partnership, that instead of bringing them into NATO, we would offer them these wonderful partnerships that would bring them into Europe as part of European free market, free visa travel, etc. Clearly, it was meant to be eventually a road to NATO membership. The Russians did not object to that. They just objected to the trade terms because they said Ukraine we are Ukraine's largest trading partner and vice versa. It's an enormous trading relationship built over centuries. If you are going to let Europe's goods flow through Ukraine without customs into our markets, our producers are going to be destroyed. This has to be negotiated. And the European Union absolutely refused to negotiate for two years with Russia. So Putin then said, okay, let's make this a tripartite arrangement. Let's do a trade partnership between Russia, Ukraine, Kiev, and the European Union. And he was told, take a walk. So now, go look at the partnership agreement that the elected president, he was a rotter, but he was elected, of Ukraine signed, refused to sign in November 2013 that set off the protest that led to the Maidan, that led to the fall of the government, fall of government, led to the Civil War. It's a thousand pages. I did not read a thousand pages. But a person I knew said, read these seven pages buried at the end. And in that agreement that Yanukovych was supposed to sign, that was allegedly only about economics, and by the way, it was the world's worst economic deal. I mean, it would have cost Ukraine, which was already impoverished, billions and billions of dollars, and given it nothing until it went through the austerity program that has brought Greece to its knees. But if the, you know, if the Ukrainian people want to do that, good luck. It hasn't worked any place, but if they want to do it. But buried in these seven pages was a section called military security issues military security issues. NATO was not mentioned, but it says in, 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 in signing this agreement, Ukraine a bit, uh, agrees to abide by the military security policies of the European Union. What are the military security policies of the European Union? NATO. Any lawyer would have picked that up quick. Russia has a lot of lawyers, good lawyers, and they were on this. That was never reported in the American press, but 
the fact is, had Yanukovych signed that, now he wouldn't have abided by it, but he was saying, if NATO decides X, we have to do it. And Russia knew about this. So it's this NATO issue that's created this problem along with the divided Ukraine that's different from the Baltics, profoundly different. Not to mention you're talking about 400 million souls in Ukraine, and I don't know how many, in, less than in San Francisco maybe in the Baltics. I don't, I, I don't know. It's not a, not a populist era. By the way, if you give me one digression, because this is a big issue, and we need to talk to our, particularly our young people about this. It's gone down as like, you know, the 111th Amendment to the United States Constitution, that every country has a right to join NATO. No, they do not. NATO is a security organization. It is not the American Association of Retired People. I have a 24-year-old daughter with my beloved wife, Katrina, as well as some who are getting close to qualifying on their own, uh, whom I gave $15 to buy an, a membership in the American Retired so, so she could win a car more cheaply and get a lot of discounts. They take anybody. <laughs> For 15 and they have very good discounts. That's not what NATO's about. NATO either increases security or it doesn't. That's the only criterion. It's not Walmart. It's not a non-selective fraternity or sorority. It's a security organization. This bunk that the expansion of NATO has increased the security of Europe and all the new nations died in eastern Ukraine. 8,000 dead. 2 million displaced. And no end in sight. A ruined Ukraine. U Ukraine is totally economically, fiscally, financially ruination. The IMF is going to violate its own rules. It doesn't give money to countries that have sovereign unpaid debt. It's going to, it's going to, it's going to violate that rule. They've got to save, they can't let Kiev default. They're going to violate the rules, but it's ruination. This is security. Are the Balts really more secure today? Is poor little Georgia, a lovely little country where we tried to pull them into NATO more secure? I mean, it's brought nobody security. And one of the problems is, is that little countries with historical grievances against Russia, and who doesn't have a historical grievance against Russia? My grandfather didn't like the pogroms. Everybody's got a grievance against Russia. But you can't build your modern life or your modern security on ancient tombstones and going around kicking them over. You can't do that. So NATO membership, should never have been increased after the Russians abolished the Warsaw Pact. But certainly, if you really believe in NATO, you don't start taking in countries that are going to be ticking time bombs of insecurity. Now, whether anybody will ever act on Article 5, is it, or 6, 5, which says that if one nation is attacked, all the, if it evokes Article 5, all the others have to come to its defense. Alain is trying to decide now, but he won't be the decider whether France should evoke Article 5 because of what happened in Paris, which would mean that every NATO country has to join Alain in whatever he's doing, which is probably not the smartest thing in Syria. But remember, you are saying that if you take in Ukraine into NATO and a couple get in-laws get into the kind of feuds that the boot runners in Kentucky used to shoot out every week, the United States has to go to war. That's not security, that's something else. So this notion of a right to join NATO, which the NATO bureaucracy in Brussels has used to enrich itself at our expense, because the United States pays the defense budget of NATO, and the reasons countries there don't mind staying is they don't have to pay for their own defense, good deal. But this has become dangerous now, this ideology that, that there's some God-given right to be a member of NATO. Uh, if you want to understand how the Russians think about this crisis, you have to understand the causes.